Hello everyone! Lately we've been doing a lot of mods on this channel with videos on trigonometry, vectors and matrices. But this channel is not only about math, it is about technicalities of game development in general. And that is why today we'll have a look at something totally different, namely sound. So before we dive into the computer science of sound, I thought we'd first have a look at the real world physics of sound. So the first question I wanted to answer is, what is sound? It's actually pretty simple. Whenever something vibrates, it can generate a sound. For example, if I take this jar and a screwdriver and I hit the jar with the screwdriver, the jar starts to vibrate and that is what we can hear. Now, of course, you don't have to hit the jar with a screwdriver. You can also just drop it to the ground. I just wanted to do that. It was fun. And that makes a sound as well, because the glass shards start to vibrate. Now, another very important thing is that we have a medium through which that vibration can reach our ear or a microphone. On Earth, that medium is usually air, because it is all around us. But it doesn't have to be a gas, it could be a liquid. For example, if you're in a pool underwater, you could still hear some muffled sounds. And it doesn't even have to be a liquid, it could be a solid as well. For example, if you put your ear on the train rails, which by the way, you should never do, but if you were to do it, you could hear a train coming from hundreds of meters away. And for my non-metric system using friends out there, that would be a few hundred yards away. So in conclusion, when there is no medium, sound waves won't be able to reach us, and so we don't hear them. Movies oftentimes get this wrong, unfortunately. For example, a movie that shows of an explosion going off in space will often add a sound to it. But that's of course wrong, because you're not going to be able to hear that sound, since space is one big vacuum and the sound waves won't be able to travel to you. Another important aspect of sound is that it travels at a speed of 300 meters a second. Which means that if an explosion goes off at, let's say, one kilometer away, and that would be approximately 1,000 yards away, then you'll first see the explosion and only hear it a bit more than three seconds later, because that's the time it takes for the sound to travel that one kilometer distance. At this point, you might get a bit bored by all the physical properties, so let's actually get a bit more theoretical. Because we can also draw a sound wave, for example, like this. What I've drawn here is a sine wave. It's based on the mathematical sine function, but it's just stretched a bit horizontally and vertically. The y-axis represents how much your medium moves, and the x-axis is time. So from this graph you can see that as time moves on, your medium will vibrate up and down. There's two things that characterize a sound wave, or any wave for that matter, and that is the height of the wave, often referred to as the amplitude, and the lower the amplitude, the more silent it will be, and the higher the amplitude, the louder it will be. The other important characteristic is the time between two peaks. We refer to that as the period, and it is measured in seconds. Usually, though, we don't refer to this as the period, but rather as the frequency. And the frequency is just 1 divided by the time there is between two peaks. This is expressed in hertz, and you can just think of that as the amount of resonations you've got in one second. If you've got lots of these in one second, then your voice will sound really high. And if you've only got a few of them every single second, then your voice will sound very deep. Now that we've represented our sound wave theoretically, it's time to capture it so we can put it into a computer. And to do that, we use a microphone. Now there's lots of different microphones out there, but I'll be explaining the dynamic microphone. Inside of it, there is a capsule. And let me just unscrew this. Hold on, it, it takes a while. Just hold on. Oh, there we go. So this thing right here is the capsule. And all it is, is it's usually a piece of cardboard which starts to vibrate whenever a sound wave hits it. Attached to that is a coil, which is a wire that's rolled up. And it will vibrate together with the cardboard since they are attached. Also inside of this is a magnet which sits inside of the coil. And whenever the cardboard and coil starts to vibrate, the coil will move over the magnet. And due to a physical property, whenever a coil moves through a magnet, or a magnet moves through a coil, 
there will be some electricity that gets generated inside of that coil. And we can leverage that electricity to turn our sound into something digital. Usually it's only a few millivolts, which is unfortunately not enough. So we put it through an amplifier, which will take those few millivolts and turn it into a signal that is, let's say, between negative one and one volts. And then we can use that signal to put it through an analog to digital converter, which converts the electricity into a number, let's say between 0 and 255. Now I haven't chosen this number by accident. In fact, 255 is the maximum value you can represent using 8 bits, 8 zeros and 1s. It also means that you have 255 steps to determine the height of your audio wave at any given time. Usually 8 bits is not enough because it goes kind of in steps and it also has a very distinct sound to it. This is what an artificial 8-bit recording would sound like. A few decades ago that was what we had to work with, but these days we've got 16-bit, 24-bit and even 32-bit analog to digital converters. The untrained ear will probably not be able to tell the difference between a 24-bit and 32-bit recording, but the extra data is quite important nonetheless when you want to apply some effects to your audio in post-processing. So our analog to digital converter just gave us a number which determines the height or amplitude of our sound wave at any given time. Now the only thing we have to do is just do that a lot of times every single second so we can sample the entire curve over time. Some common sample rates are 44,100 and 48,000. It means that we measure the amplitude of our sound wave that amount of times every single second. This results in a rather massive amount of data if we've got a very long song or a very long recording, and so we apply some very clever compression techniques. For example, the mp3 file format leaves out the frequencies that we won't be able to hear anyways. The FLAC audio format uses a more common lossless compression format and then we've got the WAV format which doesn't apply any compression at all and results in huge files. Now one important thing here when we convert from analog to digital audio is a phenomenon called clipping. As I just said, the signal of your microphone will get put through an amplifier and that signal will go into the analog to digital converter, which expects the signal, let's say, to be somewhere between negative one and one volts. Now, if you yell into the microphone, it could happen that the signal gets above one volt. And now the question is, what will the analog to digital converter do? If it's an 8-bit one, it can't output a number larger than 255, so it will just output that number, which results in a chopped off audio wave, and this distorts the sound quite significantly. If we do it artificially, that would sound something like this. It's absolutely terrible. There's a few options you've got to solve this. One of them is just to turn down the gain on your amplifier such that the signal is still below that one volt threshold. Another option would be to use a compressor which will turn down the gain automatically when the audio gets too loud. So at this point we have a bunch of numbers which represent our sound curve over time. The question now is how do we use this list of numbers to play back the audio? We just apply the same process as recording the sound but in the reverse order. This means that the computer will put those numbers into a digital to analog converter which takes in a number between let's say 0 and 255 and will turn it into a small little voltage between let's say negative 1 and 1 volts. Now that is not enough to drive a speaker, so we put it through an amplifier first, which will boost the voltage, and then we send that electrical signal to our speaker. Our speaker is actually built the same way as a microphone, but usually on a bigger scale. Once again, you've got a piece of cardboard to which a coil is attached. Your amplifier will send some electricity through that coil, which magnetizes the coil. And since there's also a static magnet inside of the speaker, the coil will attract the magnet and the cardboard moves back and forth, which generates our original audio wave. Last but not least, I've got one question which I want to answer. How do we play back multiple sounds? Well, just as in the real world, whenever two sounds play on top of each other, you just sum up their waves. In other words, you sum up the amplitude at any given time. So in terms of a computer, you just have to sum up the appropriate numbers. And that will give you the sum of the sounds, and therefore you'll hear all the sounds that you sum up all at once. That was everything I wanted to cover in this video. 
Please leave a comment to let me know what you think of this kind of new format. And by the way, everything I tell here is based on my own game engine that I'm currently writing, because a few weeks ago I added a sound engine to it, which allows me to play back sounds in the way I just described. It's all on GitHub, a link is in the description below. If you enjoyed the series, then consider becoming a patron on patreon.com forward slash floatymonkey. And with that being said, I'll see you all next time. Goodbye.